return to our series on uh, Second Corinthians. And if you recall, we are uh, at chapter 11, verse 1. And I want to begin uh, today by reading uh, first the first four verses of chapter 11, which will be our focus this morning. But I also want to read a couple of other verses um, from 12 through 15, just in terms of context, but verses that we'll look at in uh, weeks to come. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse 1. I hope that you will put up with me in a little bit of foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the snake's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus that we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one that you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. And then verse 12. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder... For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. The word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this um, fellowship, even over uh, the distance of our place, that we can join our hearts and minds together in our worship of you. We ask that you would list, lift each of us to your throne of grace, and that you would meet us there, that you would breathe your life-giving spirit anew, across our minds and hearts and even our bodies, that we might be freshened, awakened, and refreshed. Just as you breathed your life on those uh, dead bones of Ezekiel's vision and caused them to come to life, would you enliven us today, we pray. You're worthy of all of our worship and adoration and love, and we thank you for the means that you've given to us whereby we withdraw from our lives and our responsibilities to this place of this holy place of worship where we might have our minds and hearts and affections rekindled and renewed and we pray that you would do that today lord we thank you that you are faithful we thank you that you are not in any way hindered in the demonstration of your grace and mercy to us. That there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from your love. And though we are separated from many things in these days of this pandemic and the implications and impact of all of that, we are not separated from you, nor one another. And we thank you for that. We pray this morning for those who are weary you know us, you know our frame. You know there are times uh, when we do well and times when we feel the burden of the situation. And you're not at all put off by our humanness. So for any this morning who gather and whose hearts are, are heavy, whose spirits are weary, would you lift them today? And may they leave our time uh, unburdened 
renewed, hopeful, glad in you we pray. We pray for uh, all of those people that are fighting fires today. We thank you for them. We pray your safety over them. We pray for success for them. We pray for those who have lost homes. And we pray that somehow in the midst of all of that, that you might show um, yourself, that you might cause your goodness in that loss to pass before them. We pray for our witness in all of these things, for the witness of your people, that we might have opportunity to show your love and that we might not be hindered in any way, Lord, in the mission that you have entrusted to us. So we pray for that. We pray for those who are uh, in need of your touch. We pray for Faye today. We thank you for her successful surgery. We pray for Laverne. We thank you for your protection and watch care over her and continue to pray for her recuperation. We pray for those who have lost the many people, families whose lives have been changed forever. We pray for our nation in these days, these important days. Lord, that you would bring us to a needed repentance and acknowledgement of our utter dependence upon you. We pray that you would sovereignly bring about your will and purposes for us. We, we know that we do not know why and what and what you intend, but we know that your judgments are perfect and we trust you with them. We thank you for your word to us. We pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, uh, give us the ability to hear and to see and to understand it, and that you would shape our wills by it, shape our souls, shape our lives. We thank you for it. Help us now, we ask. Pour out an extra measure of grace and quickening. We pray all of these things in the precious name of our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Second Corinthians 11 through 13 is the impassioned climax of the letter. Chapter 10 is the preamble to this section. It is commonly, if you've studied Second Corinthians, you know that it is commonly referred to as the fool speech for this reason. Chapter 11, verse 1, I hope that you will put up with me, Paul writes, in a little foolishness. Verse 16, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or slaps you. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. And then verse 21 Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Then chapter 12, verse 6, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. And then chapter 12, verse 11, I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. The question is, how does Paul make a fool of himself, and why, and for what purpose, and to what end? He makes a fool of himself by boasting of himself. It would have never entered his mind to do so. That was completely anathema to, to his understanding of himself as a sinner saved by grace, 
completely contrary to his understanding of his calling as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He could take no credit for that by the grace of God. I am what I am. And completely incompatible with his understanding of ministry. That he would ever make it in any way about himself or focus on himself. Or any kind of self-promotion. As he states at the end of chapter 10, quoting Jeremiah, but let the one who boast, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Then why does he? Why does he engage in what he clearly finds really distasteful? Contrary to everything he was and everything he knew and believed. It is his response to the boasting of his opponents, his rivals who were vying for the leadership of the church, who were completely shameless in their boasting. It was all about them, about their impressive credentials, their impressive abilities and gifts, their impressive techniques and strategies, their appeal, their success, their message, all of which they consider to be superior and clearly more suited and relevant to the successful and sophisticated unbelievers of Corinth. And of course, they contrasted all of that with Paul, disparaging his extensive suffering, his modest appearance, his humility, his simplicity of life and lack of means, his lack of sophistication, his lack of style and technique. All of the carnal qualities that they boasted of that appeal to carnal ambitions. So Paul is responding to them. He is answering their boasting with his boasting, but with this important caveat. They are serious. He is not. He is tongue-in-cheek. He is engaging in parody. He is showing the foolishness of their boasting by the foolishness of his boasting. And the way he does that is by boasting of the things that show his weakness. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. As when he was lowered in a basket outside of the city wall of Damascus. Or his thorn in the flesh, as we'll see. Why was that contrast important? Why does Paul resort to that parody? Why did it matter? Why did their presence matter? What was so serious about some rival Christian leaders who thought a lot of themselves and their abilities and their ability to be more relevant and appealing to the unbelievers of Corinth? What was so harmful about them? Kind of slick, not much emphasis on the cross, light on scripture, entertaining, practical, appealing to the felt needs of unbelievers, maybe not to my liking, maybe not what I'm looking for, but maybe to reach some that I might not be able to. After all, they were servants of Christ, as Paul will claim or quote their claim later in the chapter. maybe with a different paradigm of ministry, a different emphasis, but still Christians, still servants of Christ. Here's Paul's answer, his important answer. It would be very easy to breeze over these verses while, without pausing to really understand their meaning and significance and import. 
but they expressed the specific and deep concern that was at the heart of the letter. Everything that takes place in both of the Corinthian correspondence, all of the history that we've chronicled, at the heart of his concern are what's revealed in these four verses. They expressed the specific and deep concern that was at the heart of the letter. And it's important that we hear and clearly understand that concern. So we're not going to hurry through them. We'll take these four verses alone. First of all, his concern was based upon his understanding of the purpose and intent of ministry, of Christian ministry. Verse 2. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. This is how Paul understands ministry and the fundamental responsibility of anybody engaged in Christian ministry. He uses the language of betrothal, of engagement. It's the picture of the father of the bride, the father protecting, guarding the chastity of his daughter so that he might present her first and only and exclusively in all purity to her husband. for which he jealously watches over and protects her. Highly attuned to anything or anyone that would in any way threaten or jeopardize that. That's a godly jealousy. A hostility toward anything that would threaten or harm the object of our love or affection. That's a godly jealousy. God is a jealous God which speaks of his hostility toward anything that would threaten or harm the object of his love. Important to understand that. God's jealousy is not about him being jealous about getting what is due him. In other words, it's not focused on him. His jealousy is focused on us and his hostility toward anything that would harm his creation, including us. The object of sinful jealousy is ourselves, not getting our due, not getting what we think we're owed or what we deserve. That's not God. God is jealous for us, for our good, against anything that would in any way lessen or diminish us. So it's important to understand, very importantly, Paul was not jealous for himself, not about his popularity and standing in the congregation and that being threatened by rivals. That's not the jealousy. He was jealousy for the purity of the Corinthian believer's relationship to Christ. He wasn't for their jealous for their relationship with him. He was jealous for their relationship with Christ. What a powerful image. <laughs> what a powerful and instructive image. That everything we do in ministry has one single aim and purpose. Protecting, nurturing, and deepening the relationship between the believer and Christ. We are jealous for everything that protects and guards and nurtures that relationship and jealously on guard against anything or anyone that would in any way threaten to harm or diminish that relationship. Like a loving father guarding the chastity of his daughter. We should be pit bulls when it comes to that. Why does Paul resort to the fool speech? Why does he go to that extent? Because of what was threatened because of his jealousy for the relationship between those believers and Christ. Why would he not preach himself? 
Why would he not peddle the word of God? You'll remember those phrases earlier on in the letter. Why would he not water it down to make it more marketable and appealing? Because of the impact of that on the relationship between the believer and Christ. And he saw that as a lifelong, never-ending responsibility for whatever God had placed in his charge and care. When a person comes to Christ, they are pledged to Christ, awaiting the consummation. The day that they stand before him as the bride of Christ, that consummation will take place. Our responsibility is to present them to him as a pure virgin. Only, exclusively, completely his. That's job one of ministry. Isn't that helpful? You know, it's been pointed out that if you uh, don't know where you're going, you'll get there every time. If I was to ask you, what is the object of Christian ministry, what would be your answer? What's the purpose? I think it is boiled down to its most fundamental, succinct, and profound purpose. And that is the job of ministry, job one, is to present every believer in our charge, placed in our life, that God has given us the ability and responsibility to influence, to present them on that day, a pure virgin, his one and only. That cuts through the fog, doesn't it? What if we evaluated everything we do in ministry through that grid? How is it contributing to that? How is it hindering that? That's our task. Which we can only do through the word of God in the power of the Spirit of God, in utter dependence upon God, in and through our weakness. Let me say that again. That task, how, how do we accomplish that task? How is Christ formed in others? How are their hearts pared away of all of the chaff that vies for the health and quality and depth of that relationship. How do we do that? Through the word of God and the power of the spirit of God in utter dependence upon God in and through our weakness. Because when we are weak, then we are strong. As Paul will conclude in chapter 12, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the, the power of Christ might rest upon me. We can only effectively minister Christ's glory through Christ's power. Therein lay the fundamental difference between Paul and the rival apostles at Corinth, their aim and their means. Christ's glory Christ's power versus self-glory, self-power. I promised you to one husband, to Christ. When telling thy salvation free, let all absorbing thoughts of thee, my heart and soul engross. And when all hearts are bowed and stirred beneath the influence of thy word, Hide me behind thy cross. That was Paul. His concern was based upon his understanding of the purpose and intent of ministry. Number one. Number two. His concern was based upon his understanding of the principal threat to that purpose and intent. Let me say that again. His concern was based upon his understanding of the principal threat to that purpose and intent. Verse 3. 
But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the snake's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That too is a powerful image, an illusion. It is to the garden and to the fall. How significant is that scene? That's the scene that Paul alludes to. To ease being deceived by the serpent and led astray. So think about that. Paul compares the situation at Corinth, their embrace of these rival leaders, to the fall and to that scene. Which, if nothing else, underscores the seriousness with which he viewed that situation. How could you compare that situation to that? He would not have used that comparison lightly or simply for dramatic effect. He would never do that. This was a real and significant concern. It constituted a clear and present danger. The question is why? Here it is. We live in contested territory. A spiritual contest is being waged over hearts and minds. It's going on all around us. It was basically the picture, wasn't it, of Bunyan's Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress. It was, the, it was the illustration, the analogy of that great conflict. And it's lifelong for each of us. From the time that we are pledged to Christ until the time of that consummation of that pledge, we are in the midst of a spiritual battle. Not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's why I read verses 14 and 15. Because as we'll see, Paul sees Satan's work behind what was taking place. Behind the situation at Corinth was nothing, nothing less than the forces of evil of Satan himself. Just as Satan had insinuated himself into God's good creation in order to spoil that good creation, so he insinuates himself into God's redemptive work and purposes to spoil that redemption. That battle is being waged, listen to this, through minds for hearts. Did you notice that correlation in the last part of verse 3? I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the snake's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The battle is through minds, four hearts. Our beliefs are commitments. The words sincere and pure are terms of fidelity. It is a play on word in the play on words in the Greek. Hoplotes, hognotes. Two words that sound alike. Hoplotes means undivided of one mind and heart. Fidelity. Unshared. Unalloyed. Unmixed. And purity. The result. both the result and the basis of that fidelity. If you're with us a number of months ago, uh, earlier on in 2 Corinthians, we talked a bit about this, that there is no such thing as partial fidelity. 
Fidelity is not a matter of degrees. It either exists or it does not. Either one and only or not. Christ is either your one and only or he's not. There's no shades, no degrees. Ideas that may seem insignificant or inconsequential can be of profound spiritual effect and consequence. Think about it. You can eat anything except from that one tree. Has God said? What could be so harmful about a single apple? Really? Fidelity was destroyed at that moment. The relationship was broken with profound and immeasurable results. Can't be measured. This is not just a culturally relevant ministry. It was carnal methods based on carnal values, appealing to carnal ambitions, and that goes to the heart of fidelity, which is at the heart of everything. That's why I titled this message, Losing Our Virtue. They were in spiritual peril, nothing less. Thirdly, his concern was based upon how easily a different version of Christian faith can emerge and how readily it is accepted. Verse 4. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus that we preached, Or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit that you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. I wasn't talking about some other religion or some other obvious cult. He was talking about a different version of our faith. that uses the same vocabulary, the same terms, Jesus, spirit, gospel, but different, other than. These leaders claimed to be Christian servants. They were clothed in Christian dress. They used Christian vocabulary, but it was a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. a gospel accommodated to cultural values and cultural ambitions of unbelievers. A version of the gospel that didn't require fidelity. A Jesus accommodated to culture is a different Jesus. A spirit accommodated to the culture is a different spirit. A gospel accommodated to the culture is a different gospel. A Jesus proclaimed of love that doesn't require repentance is a different Jesus. I read... Uh, some time ago now, Eric McTaxx's biography on Bonhoeffer, which I think I've mentioned to you is uh, maybe one of the most relevant books you could read in our midst of our environment right now. Trisha's been reading it and she's come back and been reading to me sections that have been 
particularly of uh, interest to her. And it's reminded me again of, uh, and I've gone back to read some of those things again. But I want to share with you because I thought it was so telling in terms of this point that Paul is making. How easily a different version of Christian faith can emerge that is readily and widely accepted. Bonhoeffer had come in the early part of his teaching career. He was a trained doctoral theologian in Germany. He had come to Union Seminary in New York, which at that time was the, uh, you know, the, the, the bastion of, uh, of liberal Christianity. Bonhoeffer, if you read his biography, may not have been a believer yet then. But it wasn't the churches, including the Riverside Church, which I'm going to mention in just a moment, that were in close proximity to Union Seminary in New York that impacted him. It was the African-American churches in Harlem. It is where he experienced, I think, for the first time, the true gospel. And over the that and through that experience and over that time, he comes, I'm convinced, to a place of genuine personal saving faith that utterly revolutionizes his approach to scripture and his understanding of the gospel and of Christ. Well, if you know the story, Bonhoeffer was one of the leaders who um, was involved in the movement of the confessing church. The state church was in bed with the Third Reich and with Hitler, and um not contradicting the views of the Jews, the treatment of the Jews, etc. Bonhoeffer and, um, and also Karl Barth were the principal architects in the emergence of what was called the Confessing Church, which was in, a, in essence an underground church and a resistant church to what was happening. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Many, because Bonhoeffer was such an important leader, many people believed he needed to flee Germany so that he would be available after its destruction to be a part of its rebuilding. So the strings were pulled, all kinds of things were done to bring him back to the United States, to get him a teaching position, to protect him so that he would be available. But he came here in great spiritual conflict. And it's, it's, uh, it's a remarkable personal account to read. But he came to the conclusion that he had no right to go back and be a part of the rebuilding if he wasn't part of the struggle. And so all those efforts, and people have made a lot of effort to secure that, to get him there, he bellied down before the Lord and came to the conclusion he needed to go back, which if you know the story, he did. And then he is eventually uh, arrested and then spends two years in prison and then is hanged in the gallows shortly before the end of the, the end of the war. But he was in a tremendous spiritual conflict. He's staying in a guest, beautiful guest quarter at Union Seminary. He gets up on a Sunday morning and he longs, uh, he's just dying for God's presence and a word from God. And so he goes to Riverside Church, the great church in Manhattan. This amazing facility that was built by Rockefeller back in 1930 as a pulpit for Harry Emerson Fosdick, who was the leading preacher and leading leader of this liberal, broad version of Christianity. I share all of that with you because I want to read Bonhoeffer's response. This is what the biographer says. He was aching for something of God, he burned to hear something of God. And Bonhoeffer was always exceedingly gracious and tolerant. But when he came back from that service, hearing uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick preach and sitting through that worship service, he wrote in his diary, of course, it was for himself, for no one else, he wrote, quite unbearable. And then he went on. Listen to these words. The whole thing was respectable. Self-indulgent, self-indulgent, self-satisfied religious celebration. And he wrote this, this sort of idolatrous religion stirs up the flesh, which is accustomed to being kept in check by the word of God. Now you understand at that time, that was a Christian church, Jesus, spirit, gospel, all of the vocabulary, all of the 
patterns of worship that would have been familiar to us, but utterly devoid, as Bonhoeffer will go on to write in great extent, of any sense of God or of Christ or of the gospel. I thought to myself as I was reflecting on that, how many gathered week by week precisely because they never had to make Christ their one and only. Precisely because. Who put up with it easily enough. Let me bring this to a conclusion with a couple of points of application. It's an important question to ask ourselves. Is he our one and only? Truly. Without question. Because understand that that was not easy or automatic in Paul's day. Think about it. The church that he had carved out by God's calling and through the work of the Spirit, when there had been no church in that place, for which he had labored long and hard, was so quick to accept easily enough another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. If it wasn't easy or automatic in his day, it's no easier in our own. If we don't take his concern seriously, we should be seriously concerned. Ideas matter. They have consequences. We can easily be led astray from one and only. A recent article by Brett McCracken for the Gospel Coalition, he writes this, among the many ways that 2020 has been punishing for pastors and churches. One of the most disheartening is the way that COVID-19 has further accelerated the already troubling tendency of Christians being shaped more by online life and its partisan ideological ecosystem than by church life and its formational practices. It was already an uphill battle before COVID. The digital age and more broadly our secular age has greatly expanded the horizon of ideas shaping Christians. We're only a click or two away from some idea to capture our imagination and capture our hearts. While we were on vacation, we got word of a, a church that we are very, very familiar with. In fact, we've attended there at times when we were in between. A pastoral couple that has given their lives to that work, that is being rent asunder by the political infighting of Christian believers. People that have been in that congregation 15 or 20 years leaving. It's heartbreaking to us. We've lived through that kind of thing. So we know heartbreaking. There is no political party of Jesus. I hope you know that. There's not. If you're preaching a Jesus of a particular political party, that is another Jesus. He stood before the politician of his time, Pilate, and said, what? My kingdom is not of this world. If you preach a Jesus of a particular political party, that is a different Jesus, because his kingdom is not of this world.
our one and only. We ought to be jealous for that. We ought to be pit bulls when it comes to that. Let me end with this. In 1889, an affluent Sikh family in India, there was born a son, Sundar Singh. He grew up to hate Christianity in his view, it was a foreign religion. He even expressed his hostility at the age of 15 by publicly burning a gospel. But three days afterward, he was converted through a vision of Christ. And later, though still in his teens, he determined to become a sadhu, that is a wandering holy man and preacher, but for Christ. And he did that all of his life. On one occasion, Sundar Singh visited a Hindu college and was accosted rather aggressively by a lecturer, lecturer who asked him what he had found in Christianity that he did not have in his old religion. I have Christ, he replied. The lecturer was a little exacerbated at the answer, said, yes, I know, I... And he continued impatiently, but what particular principle or what particular doctrine have you found that you have that you did not have before? Sundar Singh answered, the particular thing I have found, he replied, is Christ. Christ alone, one and only, for which Paul was jealous, and for which I pray that we might be as well. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these verses to ponder, to consider their importance, what they say. We long for, the, for your bride to be presented to you in all of its beauty and glory and fullness. And we want to be your hand and your instrument in furthering that purpose. First and foremost among, among and with those whom you entrust to our charge. And so, Lord, would you help us to do that as we can only do it in the power of Christ? And so would you refine us? Would you continue to hone our hearts and desires and affections that we might be wholly yours, wholly dependent upon you, wholly empowered by you with only one aim and ambition that you would be wholly the possession of others and nothing else. Help us, we pray. We pray for your church in these days. We know that you have a purpose in what you're doing, but we, we know also that we have an adversary who delights in exploiting all of the vulnerabilities that have come with our isolation and with our access to so much information through which our adversary can find a way to enter our minds and thus enter our hearts. And so we need you. We pray for your churches that name your name. We pray for your shepherds that preach your word and preach Christ. We pray for revival and we pray for awakening in these days. We don't want to surrender to them. We don't want to chafe underneath them. We want to submit to them, but we don't want to surrender to them. So help us, we pray. Thank you for these dear ones. Thank you for their faithfulness and incentiveness to your word. Help us, we pray. We know that we can have blind spots to ourselves. We know that we're not called to a ministry of looking for every 
heresy, but we want to be attuned to those things that threaten the well-being of your people. And we want to make a difference. So by your grace and through your spirit, would you help us to do that, we pray. We thank you for your table. We thank you that we can come and meet with you and have you again break that bread and hand us that cup and feed our souls and feed our spirits as you fed us through your word. So now would you do that? Would you meet us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit? We bless you. In Jesus' name.